This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I am Ariana Parts, physical therapist and your host, and today I'll be interviewing Dr. Matteo Castaldo to talk about physical therapy management in primary headache. Dr. Castaldo is a physical therapist and a postdoc researcher focusing on chronic neck pain, chronic headache, its mechanisms, and central sensitization. He works as a part-time treating clinician specializing in neck pain and headache, as well as teaches postgraduate courses. In our discussion today, you are going to learn the difference between primary and secondary headaches, how tension type headache differs from migraine, mechanisms involved in headache physiology, the role of musculoskeletal dysfunctions in headache management, and how to treat and assess migraines. So if you think that this information is valuable, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel, click on the notification bell to stay updated, Give us a thumbs up and share with other clinicians if you might benefit from this information. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the Do Anything, Anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Fitter First, your first choice for the best Canadian-made rehab and fitness products since 1985. Hi, Mateo. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you feeling today? Hi, Mariana. Thanks you for inviting me. I'm feeling great. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for coming, accepting my invitation to come here talk to us today. Um, so let's get started. Just telling a little bit about yourself, your career, and what have you been doing? Yeah. Actually, I am a physical therapist born in Italy. I graduated in physical therapy in 2007 in Parma University, which is actually my hometown. And then I started uh, taking different courses in manual therapy with international teachers from the US, from Australia, South Africa, and different parts of Europe. Uh, and meanwhile, I started working as a physical therapist with a special interest in manual therapy. Uh, in particular, I started dealing with patients affected by, by craniocervical region pain, so TMJ dysfunction, as well as neck uh, dysfunction, whiplash, and headache, for sure, and chronic pain population in general, more, more, more in particular about chronic pain. Then, uh, continuing with my academic uh, background, I specialized myself into cognitive neuroscience in the University of Milan, always in Italy. I took a Master of Science uh, as I think that as a physical therapist, we need to improve our skill in cognitive and psychological assessment and management for as clinicians for our patients, especially for those affected with chronic pain conditions. And then I further specialized myself to taking a PhD in biomedical science at the Alborg University in Denmark, where my research field was about uh, whiplash disorders, headache, and central sensitization mechanism, and how can we assess them in the clinical setting. So that's uh, basically a, a summary of my education, uh, which led me to work uh, to nowadays uh, as a part-time uh, researcher, part-time postdoc still at Holberg University, uh, managing re different research projects in the headache field, uh, and part-time as a clinician, managing uh, headache patients and as well as an educator and professor teaching in different universities and in different postgraduate courses, uh, physical therapists, uh, how to manage uh, handy conditions, uh, in particular, uh, how we can combine our assessment, our treatment with the uh, medication and with the classical intervention provided by neurologists. Awesome. That's a good mix. So you're still working some, with some research and then part-time clinician. You always know what's going on. I think it's really important because I have to admit that almost all the questions that we try to investigate and to address with our research topics comes from the clinical viewpoint. I mean, treating patients, you try to uh, design and to investigate the topics in which you are unsure, that the topic in which the scientific literature is still unsure, in order to provide a better explanation of which are the mechanisms, what's working, what's not working, and most important, why it works. 
what we are doing clinically with our patients affected by headache disorders. Awesome. And so let's start talking about the basics, definition. So what's the difference between primary and secondary headaches? Yeah, in, in general, let me say first that the headache prevalence is really high because we talk about 47% is the general prevalence in the general population, meaning that we are talking of disturbances that regardless the primary or secondary addict, but if we put all the different kinds of addicts together, are really prevalent in the general population, creates a lot of issue to the society, to the people, and in terms of uh, disability and economical burden as well. And uh, that's the first thing that we must say. Then if we go into detail, uh, as you were correctly asking, we can divide according to the International Classification of Headache Disorder, which is a kind of Bible for all those who are managing headache condition. Uh, we can divide basically headache into two main categories, being the first one primary and the second one secondary forms. What's the main difference between them? The primary headache are those in which uh, the symptoms, the headache symptoms, is not uh, uh, related to another pathology or another health issue. So we could say that the headache is the pathology itself. And the two main forms are tension type headache and migraine. The two most diffuse forms of uh, primary headache are those two, which are creating a lot of disability worldwide. Uh, when we move to the secondary headache, we must consider that they are, as the word is saying itself, they are secondary to another disorder. For example, it may be secondary to something which is really severe, like could be, uh, for example, a tumor, or some uh, blood vessel, intracranial blood vessel disease or dysfunction, but also to something which is not so uh, severe, like could be a TMJ dysfunction, a whiplash injury, or a neck dysfunction. Those are all headaches which are secondary to another condition, which may be the TMJ, the neck, uh, the vascular disease, the tumor, or whatever it may be. One of the most interesting secondary form is the medication overuse headache. That's a secondary form that always comes after a primary one because it's a headache which, is, uh, uh, which affects patients which are taking too many symptomatic drugs for a long period. So it's interesting because it seems that the more you take symptomatic drugs, the more you work on your clinical situation. And so it's like a vicious circle in which you take more drugs, you have more headache, and you develop a new kind of headache which is totally due to the overuse of the medication. And for that, the name is medication overuse headache. And this is a secondary form because it's secondary to the fact that the patient has taken too many pills to manage the symptomatic uh, episodes, per, for example, of their migraine condition or their tension type condition. So that's the main difference that we can find. So in primary headache, we don't have any other condition, at least not provo provoking the headache. While in secondary, there is something else which is explaining why the patient is suffering from headache. And so you're talking about the medication, the drugs overuse. Do you have like the most common drugs or is that something specific or is just general medication in general? Yeah, we can divide symptomatic drugs for migraine management into two main categories. Uh, the first one are more specific drugs, which are called triptans. And so the triptans are more specific for the management of migraine and are usually prescribed by a, by a GP or a neurologist. Then on the other hand, we have not specific drugs like anti-inflammatory, anti-AIDS, uh, painkillers or whatever, which usually the patient takes by himself, you know, over the counter, just taking them and often mixing them. Uh, because as a general rule, we must consider that if the patient is suffering by more than four days per month, uh, the indication are that the neurologist should prescribe a, a prophylactic medication. So something that they take almost every day in order to have a, to have a preventive action on their migraine or their general headache, if it's a primary headache. On the other end, the symptomatic drug should be used just for some of the day of the month. If you're using too many of them, being them specific like the triptans or unspecific like anti-AIDS or painkiller, you are at risk of developing, especially if you continue to keep on going with the overuse for more than three months, we, you are at high risk of developing a medication overuse headache, which as we were saying before, could be a secondary form which links to the primary one for which you are taking all the symptomatic drugs, giving a, even a more complicated uh, clinical picture, even more complicated to manage. Yeah, so just be careful with your pain medication, huh? 
Yeah, we always have to discuss with your GP or neurologist in order to avoid mixing different uh, medications which are, should not be mixed and in order to have the right one for you, the best one, the one that is working specifically because there are so many different medications that it's not easy for patients to find by themselves the best option for them. Most of the patients in the clinic, when you ask in, in your clinical investigation uh, history, you ask about, do you take any medication for your episodes? And they say, yeah, I try with that one. But does it work? No, it doesn't work at all. So the question is, so why you keep on going with taking the drug that you say that it never stop your headache? And they look at you saying, there's nothing else I could do. I mean, I always try because I hope that one day they will be working. I have no other options. Mm -hmm. But basically, that is, 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 a, is a matter, is an issue that could be managed in a better way if they discuss with the, uh, with the medical doctor about uh, a way for finding the right medication for them. Which doesn't mean that the, there will be a right medication for all of the patients. There are some which are basically not responders to symptomatic medication, but at least you can try with a medical advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And... So now let's talk about the two different types that you said that are most common on the primary headache, the tension, tension type and the migraine. So how do you differentiate both of them? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we have clinical characteristics. We can be explored with a proper investigation of the patient's medical history and uh, asking to the patients about the pain quality, about the pain location, the pain intensity, uh, about all the disability which could be related and to the other symptoms which are not headache but could be related to the headache episode. Uh, that, th all those information are highly important in order to make the right diagnosis from the neurologist. Usually if we talk about tension type headache, the pain is bilateral, the quality of pain is pressing is or tightening and the intensity should be maximum moderate so it's not severe. Uh, normally, as uh, always from the general classification in tension type headache, we should not have a worsening of the headache characteristic with routine physical activity like walking or climbing the stairs. The patient should not report any nausea during the attack. And just one between phonophobia or photophobia is allowed from the criteria, from the diagnostic criteria. And about the duration, the duration of uh, every episode of tension type headache should be uh, something in between 30 minutes and up to seven days. So it could be quite long duration, up to one week. Uh, on the other hand, when we are talking about migraine characteristic, the diagnostic criteria indicates the pain usually is unilateral instead of bilateral. The quality of pain is pulsating in, instead of uh, pressing, and the intensity is more severe. So usually the pain intensity is higher. And most important, it is aggravated by routine physical activity. So when you are having a migraine attack, just walking from one room to another or climbing the stair usually can worsen your, your episode, your, your headache feature, your headache uh, characteristic, and should be present at least one between nausea or, or vomiting, even vomiting in the migraine attack. Photophobia and phonophobia must be present as well. So from this information, you can easily understand that migraine is something more severe, which affects people creating more pain, more disability, more complaints in general. The only positive thing about migraine is, is that it's not long lasting as tension type headache because in, from the general criteria, it may be lasting up to 72 hours. So maximum three days instead of seven days, like in the tension type headache. And uh, that's the general classification and the general diagnostic criteria for the two main four. And something which is really important is also to consider that migraine is considered a cyclic disorder uh, and tension type is not. So in migraine, we can uh, divide uh, the migraine cycle into four phases. We have the interictal phases, which actually is the normal one, the one in which the patient is not experiencing any symptom. Then we have the preictal phase that is last up to two days, can last up to 40 hour, 48 hours. So up to two days before the migraine attack in which the patients is feeling a lot of fatigue, less concentration, neck pain or neck stiffness, uh, food craving, all this kind of information which are going to inform that the migraine attack is going to be present in the next few days, in the following two days. Then we have the actual ictal phase, which is the migraine phase itself. And then we have the postictal. The postictal is called also the hangover because it's the one in which the patient feels like having a hangover. So asthenia, somnolence, less concentration, depressed mood, 
uh, tiredness, so it's not feeling good at all. So you can easily see that in migraine cycle, there is only one phase in which the patient is feeling normal and good, which is the interictal phase, which may be quite short, because if you consider that you can have two days before the migraine attack in which you are not feeling good, then three days of migraine, and then two days of hangover, it means that it can be up to one week, and then maybe you have one or two days free, totally free in the interictal phase, and then you start again with a new uh, preictal phase. So you can see how the life of those suffering from migraine is really affected, not just when you are suffering from migraine episode, but also before and also after. And that's something which is mainly really different from tension type headache, which is something not related to what happens after and before, but just to the attack itself. And finally, the other big difference I would say is about the overall disability, because we have to consider that migraine is considered and is classified from the global burden of disease, which is a research group studying the disability and the years living with disability worldwide with different chronic pain condition, and is ranked first, is the first cause of disability in the people between 15 and 49 years old. Between 15 and 49 means in the period of your life in which you are supposed to be more active in terms of uh, work, family, you are engaged with a lot of activities, a lot of stuff, and your life is completely compromised because you are affected by migraine. Then it decreases a bit the disability after 50, but in that range of age, it's the most common, it's the most disabling condition worldwide. That's something that we must reflect about. Yeah, that's a huge number. It's big and yeah. the impact that, that has in people's life is just is yeah, very disabilitating. So yeah. it for sure deserves attention. And I know we're gonna talk more about migraine in depth, but just briefly for the tension type headache. Do you have any suggestions of treatments? Can we treat those? It's more like tension, do you mean is Muscle tension, like how, how does that work? Yeah, basically we can treat a, a lot of tension type headache as well, not just migraine. I mean, according to the dysfunction and to assessment of musculoskeletal impairments that we can find it that we will address later in our conversation. But about the mechanism, like you were correctly asking, uh, mainly it starts from muscles. So we have in tension type headache, like the world itself in say, in say uh, we had often, but not in all patients. So there is a subdivision also in the classification of tension type headache with pericranial muscle tenderness, which means that there are also some tension type headache without pericranial muscle tenderness. But most of the time you can find a tension, a uh, myofascial trigger point and tension in, in the muscles which are related to the neck and to the TMJ function as well. And there is an increase of tension of these muscles. So Finding the right way for relaxing these muscles is uh, fundamental in those patients by treating them manually, by giving patients exercise and teaching them how not to become hyperactive on those muscles, overuse those muscles is fundamental. So basically what we can say about the treatment of tension type headache, which is the most interesting part in my opinion, is that we can't say from the beginning, you need something different just because the diagnosis is different. Regardless the diagnosis of tension type headache or migraine, whenever I have to assess some uh, primary headache patients, the assessment is exactly the same. We must consider that when we assess and treat uh, primary headache patients, uh, it doesn't truly really matter the medical diagnosis. What I mean is that the medical diagnosis is really important in order to have the consideration about the pathophysiological mechanism to receive the best pharmacological drugs. But from our viewpoint in terms of assessment and clinical management and treatment, it doesn't truly really rely our assessment on the medical diagnosis, but about it relies more about our clinical assessment, about the musculoskeletal impairments that we can find, about the clinical history of our patients and the aspects which are most important about every single patient. And that we must do regardless the medical diagnosis. I mean that you can be a tension type headache patient or you can be a migraine patient that the assessment, the musculoskeletal impairment assessment, all our tests, physical tests are exactly the same. And the same about the question that you, you did me about the treatment, because the treatment, regardless you're a migraine or tension type patient, is exactly relying on the assessment. 
So we don't treat a migraine, we don't treat a tension type, but we treat a person and we treat the dysfunction that we find. So if we perform the right assessment, then you, you know what to do. I mean, uh, according to the dysfunction, to the impairments, to the, mo- to the most common and to the most prevalent that you find in every single person, you can stratify and plan your protocol, your approach to that patient, which is going to be different from one patient to another. And we have some basic information for sure that make us say that probably if he's a tension type patient, uh, some m- more um, soft tissue work is needed as compared to migraine patients. But that's just a general rule. I would not advise any PT to do that just basically basically on the medical diagnosis, but always rely on your clinical assessment, on the test that we're going to discuss later, and plan the best treatment in a multimodal way according to the dysfunction that you found. Okay, good. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that on the migraine, so maybe you can mention that more in depth yeah. there. But Yeah. Um, and now a, a question that I read one of the papers you sent me about the, that was a complicated one. So you can maybe summarize here for us. What's the no. role of the trigeminal cervical complex in migraines? So like what are the mechanisms involved in the headache physiology? Yeah, uh, that's the most complicated part when you talk about yeah. migraine. But it's complicated not because of the topic, but because we are not fully up aware of the mechanism. So even in the scientific paper, they just hypothesize what could be the main pathophysiological mechanism in migraine, but we are not fully aware of uh, if we are still missing something, some parts of the migraine pathophysiology. Um, We know, for example, that now migraine is considered a state, uh, a brain state of altered excitability. And that's something that has a lot of scientific literature on the background. Uh, an alteration of the sensory processing. So we know that different areas of the brain, as particular of the different cortex areas, are not working exactly as they should. And that's created some kind of trouble in terms of symptoms and manifestation of migraine, not just about pain. Uh, another mechanism, which is called thalamocortical dysrhythmia, because we know that the connection between, between the thalamus and the different cortex area are not working again as they should in normal healthy subjects and central sensitization mechanism. All of these mechanisms have been deeply studied and they are, seems to be at least to now, they all involved into migraine pathogenesis. But if we want to move to the uh, most studied mechanism is the one about the trigeminal vascular system activation. So that theory is quite old because the first time it was proposed, it was on a publication on the Lancet journal in 1981, so more than 40 years ago in which the author, the neurologist, for the first time proposed that migraine was not a vascular disorder as it was considered before, about vasodilation, vasoconstriction, so mainly based on vascular. And that was an error that it was made for many years because of the quality of pain that, as we said before, was pulsating. And in medicine, everything which is pulsating is always, you know, associated to a vascular dysfunction, so to something vascular. And now we know that the trigeminal, that the vascular part is correct, but it's not enough. Now we know that the trigeminal vascular system is activated. What is so this kind of trigeminal vascular system? This system is mainly uh, made by projections, axonal projections from, from the trigeminal ganglion uh, that innervate the PL, the arachnoid, and the dural blood vessels. And during the attack, these nerve endings become activated, it becomes sensitized and release some vasoactive neuropeptides like substance P, neurokinin, and most important, the CZRP, so the calcitonin-gene-related peptide, which is also the target of the new drugs developed for migraine, uh, because we know that it's released in large amounts, so the drugs now try to avoid its release or to bind its receptor instead of the CZRP molecule itself. Uh, So this is basically what we know what's happening right now in the migraine brain, uh, which creates a condition which is now called neurogenic inflammation and also vasodilation. So basically you can say that from the trigeminal nerve, there is this release of uh, neuropeptides, we produce more inflammation and more pain sensitization. And the trigeminal cervical complex that you mentioned before in the question becomes sensitized because of the trigeminal vascular system activation. Because this nociceptive information, once the axonal projections have been sensitized by the, those um, 
those substances, those vasoactive neuropeptides, goes to the trigeminocervical complex, which basically is a brainstem region which is receiving information from the trigeminal nerve and also from C1, C2, and C3, so the, from the first three nerve roots. Uh, by doing that, it's an intermediate station which is receiving uh, afferent and nociceptive information both from the trigeminal region, so from the face, for example, from the mouth, and from the upper cervical spine. And that it's really important because it's the neurophysiological link which allows us to understand why something which is not working properly in the neck would affect the pain which is referred and felt by the patients in the head region, in the trigeminal region, okay? In particular, the trigeminal cervical complex, those information then travel to the thalamus and hypothalamus through projection of second order neurons, and then to third order neurons to the, uh, to the cortex areas. So it's a kind of first station in which the information are sent to higher center for, to be processed and to produce the pain sensation and the other sensation and symptoms related to migraine, which are not just pain, as we said, but, but like photophobia, phonophobia, osmophobia, allodynia, uh, nausea and vomiting, all these kind of other criteria which are in, uh, included in the diagnostic criteria and could be explained by the activation of this germinovascular system and the spread of sensitization across different brain uh, region. Uh, for that reason, I really like uh, some, a, a specific definition of migraine, which has been given by a group of neurologists, some researcher, uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, which consider migraine as a complex neurological disorder, which involves different brain areas, uh, cortical, subcortical, and the brainstem region, like the trigeminal cervical complex. And those areas are controlling the cognition, the mood, sensory function and the autonomic nervous system. And for that, you can understand how complex is migraine. And migraine is not just only pain in the head, but a lot of more complex symptoms, which uh, makes us understand that it's a global dysfunction of the brain. And so it's a brain state. It's not just about the pain, a part related to uh, pain production. Okay. And you just said a lot. So how... Is that possible to be treated as sensitization of this yep. trigeminal cervical area? Can we treat? How can we treat? Basically, that's the area of our intervention. Whatever we do in our peripheral uh, part of the body, so in musculoskeletal dysfunction in the neck for, or in the thoracic spine or in the TMJ joints and muscles, uh, produce afferent inputs that converge into the trigeminal cervical complex. By understanding that, we should be able to uh, comprehend that if we decrease the amount of nociception that goes to the trigeminal cervical complex, so if we treat the peripheral part of the body, you can decrease the amount of nociception, which is called the barrage of the central nervous system, which becomes less sensitized, which becomes less hyperactive, because we receive less nociceptive information from the periphery to process and to produce pain. So basically, whatever we do with our hand as manual therapist has the target to decrease the afferent input to the trigeminal cervical complex. That's the basis of our intervention because once the central nervous system has become sensitized, we must be able to decrease the sensitization level. And as physical therapists, the best way we have is using hands-on treatment. Hands-on treatment are not enough to decrease the sensitization of the central nervous system, but it's important because the central sensitization often has a peripheral nociceptive constant input on the basis. So if we reduce or eliminate the nociceptive, the, the nociceptive input, we are able to decrease the amount of information that from the neck goes to the trigeminal cervical complex and from the trigeminal cervical complex goes to the thalamus and to the cortex. Very interesting. So we, we play a role as PTs on that on migraines, we can help to decrease that sensitization with our techniques. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, that is the basis for what I was saying before about the fact that we don't treat migraine or don't treat tension type headache, but we treat dysfunctions and people. Why? Because this mechanism is common also in tension type headache. I mean, the trigeminal cervical complex is not something that only migraine patients have. Everybody has a trigeminal cervical complex. The only, for me, the only difference is that if you are not a headache sufferer, this system is not sensitized. 
So it's receiving information from the trigeminal and from the neck region, and it's not producing a facilitation of pain and the production of headache because it's not sensitized. Once it becomes sensitized due to the prolonged afferent input uh, information, and because you have a brain state like in Maggie, which is particular from the beginning, then it becomes a problem, this station. But that's the most important thing because we can understand that the target of our intervention is the periphery. So we will talk about joint muscle dysfunction, about recruitment and stiffness or whatever. But everything we do in the periphery, when we are dealing with headache patients, in particular with migraine patients, we must do in considering uh, the whole situation of the central nervous system so it's okay. We can see our peripheral uh, action as manual therapies as a way, you know, to as a gate to access to the central nervous system in order to decrease the sensitization of the central nervous system. And for that reason, you can do that even if the patient is tension type, is migraine, is uh, medication overuse, is cervicogenic, whatever is the diagnosis. You must be able to decrease the nociceptive information to the trigeminal cervical complex first, and then to the upper. Uh, central nervous system region. Okay. And do you know what causes that sensitization to get started with? Yeah, the sensitization, I mean, if we're talking about central sensitization, we know from the literature that it always starts from something which is not working properly in the periphery, meaning that it must be something, there must be some peripheral input, which if it's long lasting and if it's accompanied by other nociceptive inputs, so there is an effect of temporal summation and spatial summation, so more afferent input from the periphery, from different region, and in a prolonged way, so for a long and constant time, that may sensitize the central nervous system. And in that case, we move from a peri peripheral sensitization to a central sensitization. Central sensitization, as we are talking about that, is a physiological phenomenon in, a, in acute condition, uh, meaning that it Central sensitization is something that will helps me to protect myself and, until the tissue is healed. So if I got an injury, if I got an acute problem, uh, it develops a peripheral sensitization first, so on the local nociception of the tissue, which has been injured, and then it spreads to a central sensitization in a physiological way in order to, produ to protect that part of the body, that region, al uh, until it becomes completely recovered, completely healed. The problem is when central sensitization becomes predominant in the clinical picture and it lasts even longer after that there is nothing more to say, nothing more to protect. And that's exactly the situation in which chronic, in particular chronic headache patients are, in which there is a central sensitization which is facilitating all the pain mechanism. There is, the, there is also this function of the pain control system, so the, the, all the system into the body that can decrease the nociceptive information to the, to the central nervous system. And in that situation, you can easily understand that there is a, the final effect is a facilitation of the afferent nociceptive information to the brain, which becomes sensitized because it has to process too many information for such a long period. Okay. And could that be like, for example, a whiplash injury, like you had a car accident, you had a whiplash could be just muscle tightness, could be like joint restrictions of motion, like the decreased range of motion on the neck. Could all of that play a part on that? Yeah, because we know that central sensitization plays, plays a huge role in whiplash, chronic whiplash in particular. So we know that the trauma itself, the accident itself, creates uh, uh, some muscle tension, some spasm, some pain, which should be resolved in a few days. If it's not done, it's because it creates a central sensitization, which produces a long lasting nociceptive input from the neck region to the brain. So you become, the brain becomes always more sensitized and that creates a vicious circle for which you are afraid of moving. So you develop kinesophobia. You are afraid that there must be something broken in your neck because they say that it was going to uh, fi be fixed and to solve in few days. And after maybe one month or two months, you still experience symptoms like uh, dizziness, like headache, like fatigue, like muscle tension. So central sensitization is a condition which is, has been uh, really studied in whiplash patients, especially in those who are developing chronic symptoms, in which there is an interesting study from an um, Australian research group about 15, 20 years ago, in which they proved it was a longitudinal study that those who develop chronic 
we clash are those who have already developed central sensitization in the first month after the accident. So in the first month, if your brain becomes sensitized, then you will be a chronic whiplash patient after one year. So everything creates quite fast in the first month. And for that reason, it's important. It's really important in that specific condition to address any issue before the sensitization spread and becomes uh, predominant in the clinical picture. And do you think that most migraine patients, they had to have like a traumatic event or just like our day-to-day -day tensions, the way you sleep, I don't know, anything else that causes tension on the neck, could that be enough to cause migraine and that sensitization? I would say that if we talk about tension type headache, I would say that everyday activity, the lifestyle, the activity, the physical activity, posture, muscle tension and whatever, are really important in the genesis and in the maintenance and the evolution of tension type headache because we had good evidence about that. But about migraine, as I said before, is a complex, much more complex neurological disorder, which has also some genetic and familiarity, meaning that you have uh, your parent or brother or uncle or whatever, a familiar, which is affected by migraine. We know that it's, uh, it's higher the probability that you are affected as well. So there is also a genetic component. I would never consider migraine as a genetic disorder because if you say to a patient that it's genetic, it means that there is nothing you can do to manage that because it's genetic. So you have just been unlucky to be son of somebody suffering from migraine. We know that it de depends from many, many stuff. It's a multi, uh, you know, there are, it's multimodal. There are different aspects which can uh, create and change the course of your migraine. But for sure, there is a substrate with, which is a particular brain which you her uh, hereditate from your family most of the time. Then, like you were saying, depending also on the tension, on the stress, on what you eat, how you sleep, on the physical activity, the posture, the neck dysfunction, and many different aspects, your migraine can become even worse or can be uh, in, a, in a kind of way a good migraine that you can manage without d disrupting your life, without creating too much disability. So there is a part also in, Talking about the clinical management, uh, that makes you understand that there is a part of migraine that we can manage and the part that we can't. Our goal is to improve the lifestyle, to decrease the uh, musculoskeletal impairments, which can in some kind of way worsen the clinical picture. We can uh, educate the patients in terms of management on the long term, and that should decrease the disability, decrease the frequency, the intensity, uh, and the duration of migraine attacks. But we, you could never say, I'm going to fix and resolve your migraine. Because as we say, it is a primary headache condition, it is a complex neurological disorder. So you could never say, I'm going to resolve your migraine, but we're going to try to uh, include in our management all the different aspects related in order to decrease as much as possible the burden of your migraine. But you will still be a migraine patient. That's really important also in order to be clear with our patient and not promising I'm going to be the next one who promises you that I'm going to fix your migraine. Because most of the time we see patients which have already been uh, visited and treated by so many different specialists that promise them, I'm going to fix you, I'm going to solve the problem. And they were disappointed most of the time because it didn't happen if they come to you. So you have to be honest and to not to promise about resolving the migraine, but managing all the different aspects which are involved into migraine in order to decrease the disability, the burden, and to improve the quality of life. That's the final goal, definitely, I would say, in migraine patients. Mm -hmm. And just going back to the tension type, is the prognosis different? So if you treat the tension, can you get a better like long-term relief for those patients? Yeah, sure. Uh, but I was not saying that in migraine you can't have a good long-term effect. Mm -hmm. Otherwise... I mean, most of the patients that I see in the clinic are migraine. Most of the scientific literature about uh, uh, physical therapy and headache is about migraine, not about tension type. So for sure in tension type, it's even clearer our role because the muscle tension, muscle dysfunction is predominant in that clinical picture. Uh, but that doesn't mean, I didn't want to mean that in migraine, we, we can just do a few. We can do a lot for those kind of patients. Uh, just figure out what does it mean for migraine patients from 15, 20 days a month with migraine to decrease the frequency to four or five. It really changed, dramatically changed the quality of life. Because if you have 15 or 20 days with migraine, so if you are a chronic migraine patient, 
that means that most of your uh, routine activity, sport activity, familiar activity, work uh, and social engagement are compromised. If you just have three, four, five, I mean, I'm not saying that it's nothing. It's, it's still hard to, to, to have your normal life, but, it, but meanwhile, you know that for 25 days a month, you can do whatever you want without caring about, oh, oh my God, I'm gonna have a migraine today. So we can help both patients. Mostly I would say migraine. Most of the patients that I say are, that I see in my clinic are migraine patients, basically because as we see, I've seen at the beginning of our conversation, they show a huge disability. So you can really change the quality of life in them because they really starts from a, such a terrible level of disability. And I also like was uh, looking at the research that you sent me as well, and it was showing how uh, migraine patients, they, they present with a lot of musculoskeletal dysfunctions when they're compared to headache-free patients, right? Yeah. So there is like a huge role of the musculoskeletal dysfunctions in the headache management, right? So if you're like in your experience, do you see a lot of dysfunctions that you can treat on these um, migraine patients? Yeah, basically we see a lot of dysfunction, usually with our assessment in those patients, a lot of dysfunction that we could treat. And uh, a lot of studies has been performed by different research groups uh, trying to identify which are the most prevalent musculoskeletal dysfunctions in migraine patients and tension type as well. And basically we could say that myofascial trigger point in the craniocervical region, uh, upper cervical spine dysfunction, so about uh, muscle, uh, about the joint stiffness, and passive accessory intervertebral movement dysfunction, uh, the reproduction and resolution, which is a way important that we will discuss about that later, uh, the flexion rotation test, trying to identify dysfunction of the C1, C2 segment, a dysfunction of the uh, functionality of the deep muscles of the neck, like the, that you can, could easily identify with the craniocervical flexion test, a limited range of motion in terms of quality and quantity of movement, a forwarded posture, Thoracic dysfunction as well are the most common, at least those who have been identified in different clusters by different research groups. And what is really interesting is that uh, uh, during one of the study, this group found that 93% of migraine patients have at least three musculoskeletal dysfunction in their neck, as compared to healthy subjects, which usually doesn't present this kind of dysfunction. So that's again is the clinical basis by which our intervention could be fundamental in uh, something which may really help those kind of patients. And do you think that's cause or consequence in these migraine patients, like all those dysfunctions? Yeah, that's a nice question because it's a topic that has been debated in under the last years. And me and my research group has published many papers about that in the last two or three years. We published six, seven papers just trying to elucidate the role of neck dysfunction and uh, most important, uh, neck pain in migraine patients in order to understand who comes first, musculoskeletal dysfunction or the migraine. Because actually there are two theories. Uh, there is a bottom-up model, bottom-up theory, which basically explains uh, that if you have this musculoskeletal dysfunction, they can be considered as a peripheral source of nociception, which sensitizes the central nervous system, like we said before, uh, lowering the pain tree so so that makes you experience even more easily migraine attacks. And that's one theory. The other theory, on the other hand, says the opposite. It's called top-down model, in which it says that first you have a migraine, you develop central sensitization, and then can contribute to the development of peripheral impairments in the musculoskeletal system. What is really important is that we found that musculoskeletal dysfunction, we found that in different papers with my research group, is present in migraine patients regardless the presence of neck pain. So it's even more complicated because you can consider that there are migraine patients which are not complaining about neck pain, but have musculoskeletal dysfunction in their neck, which can contribute to the migraine pr clinical presentation. So asking about do you suffer from neck pain to a migraine patient is not enough. You always have to perform a clinical assessment because there are some patients, and I see that also in my clinical activity, that doesn't complain about the neck. Some patients, it's quite easy because they say my migraine starts from here and then spread to my eye, to my temporal region. But some other, when you ask, they say, no, 
I don't feel any involvement in my neck. My neck mobility is good. I never have any discomfort or pain in my neck. But then you see with your physical assessment that there's plenty of dysfunction. And most important, again, we found that those dysfunction are present in the whole migraine cycle because some author were, uh, some neurologists in particular, were considering those musculoskeletal dysfunction are as a consequence of migraine, coming back to your question. And so we try to understand if there are consequences or not, but we can consider them as a consequence of the migraine attack because we found that those musculoskeletal dysfunction are present also in the interictal phase. So when the patient is headache free, so they are not a consequence, they are not a symptom of the migraine attack because otherwise the patient should not have the dysfunction outside the migraine attack. But we found that those dysfunction are highly prevalent also in the interictal phase when the patient is totally addict free and the central nervous system is fine, it's not disturbed by any form of hyper excitability like in the other um, phases of the migraine cycle. So definitely musculoskeletal dysfunction are a comorbidity. We can consider them as a comorbidity, meaning that are often present together with migraine. The, I would not say that they are a consequence of migraine, but they are something which we must be able to assess in a migraine patient because we know from the literature, from the clinical aspects as well, and from papers that we published as well, that they can worsen the clinical picture. So I know that if I have a patient that has musculoskeletal impairments in the neck, has a worse disability, a worse clinical picture, and a less, less response to the pharmacological drugs as well, which is highly interesting. If you have musculoskeletal dysfunction, you respond less to the symptomatic medication. That's really interesting because it makes you understand that if your brain is disturbed by something which is not working correctly in the periphery, even the action of the molecular or the, the chemistry action of a, of a drugs that you take in order to manage it, the acute episode is less, is working less. So that's really interesting. Is that another reason, another, another more reason for which we should be able to assess and treat those dysfunctions when we find them in our migrant patients? And so how do you assess? the influence of the neck in the headache? Like, are there a um, cluster of headache assessment tests that you use? Can you give us any suggestions and tips? Yeah, I would say that the first important part is just uh, the uh, medical history investigation. So even before going to have a specific cluster of tests of assessment, just by uh, talking with the patients, uh, asking them the right question, we can have really important tips about the possible influence of the neck on their headache, regardless it's tension type or migraine. We are talking, we are focusing more on migraine, but everything I'm saying right now could be expanded also to tension type headache patients as well. Uh, but the real confirmation, so you can get the first hypothesis by the medical investigation, the medical history investigation, so questions to the patients and their answer. But the confirmation comes from physical tests that we can uh, use in our clinic, in our assessment, in order to uh, confirm the presence of musculoskeletal impairment and most important, their relevance into their clinical picture. Because you could be a migrant patient complaining about neck pain, having some, for example, range of motion restriction, totally unrelated to the migraine condition. So we must be able to find the link between those musculoskeletal dysfunction which can be easily assessed in the clinical setting with some specific test and the migraine. And I would say that the cluster of tests most important in order to do that are those who try to reproduce the headache pain in our patients. What do I mean by saying that? That we can have manual simulation on different area of the neck region and the temporomandibular joint region as well by stimulating different muscle, different joints, so articular tissue as well, and different nerve. And by stimulating those nerves, we should be able to reproduce a symptom which is similar to the headache which is usually experienced by our patients. By doing that, we have a strong confirmation about the role of the musculoskeletal impairments. And the most important of, of, of whatever I'm saying right now about this topic is that it's gonna be the first time that the patient has uh, is trying this kind of experience. I mean that the patient could have been to many different clinicians, uh, medical doctor, chiropractor, osteopaths, other physical therapists, but often I, I realize that I am the first one trying to reproduce their headache. And that gives us such a strong confirmation in order to establish a link between the neck and the migraine aspects 
the migrant reproduction or the tension type headache reproduction. And it's really uh, something really positive and something really strong also for the patient as a positive reinforcement in trying to link with some kind of education ex and explanation about the possible link. Because I'm not just saying that your neck is involved in your migraine, but I'm also showing you by reproducing your pain by pressing something in your neck. So for all this reason, I would say that reproduction and resolution, meaning that I should be able to switch on your headache and to switch off your headache if I sustain the pressure, is the most important aspect. Then, as I said before, you could assess for the quality of motion, for the recruitment of muscles. You can see many different aspects which are, are related to musculoskeletal dysfunction in, uh, in the neck or cr craniofacial region as well. But the most important to me are those who are trying to reproduce the patient's symptoms. If I I'm able in different body location to reproduce your headache, I can conclude at the end of my assessment of the first visit that for sure I can help you. For sure, that be that can be something can be done in order to improve the clinical characteristic of your migraine. Otherwise, on the other hand, which it doesn't happen so often, but sometimes may often, if I'm not able to find any single dysfunction which is able to reproduce your headache features, probably the role of the musculoskeletal system is is very low or in some kind of way is not important in order to manage your your complaints. There are some studies, just to conclude, saying that 95% of migraine and tension type headache have headache reproduction with special tissue manual uh, stimulation. That means to me that almost all migraine and tension type pa patients have some, you know, muscle skeletal dysfunction, which we can um, stimulate with manual palpation in order to try to reproduce their headache. And that's the most important for me in the, in the assessment test. And when you say stimulating, you are kind of like pressing different areas of the neck and uh, around it to see if that reproduces the pain. Yeah. And basically, uh, if we come back to the mm, uh, neurophysiological mechanism that I explained you before, it's easy to understand, to understand what happens. If you try to stimulate, like you were saying, with your manual palpation, for example, a myofascial trigger point or a dysfunctional joint of C1, C2, for example, what are you doing? You are just with your pressure is you're increasing the nociceptive input to that region, right? If you're increasing the nociception, you're increasing the information that are going to the trigeminal cervical complex. And if you're increasing in an artificial way, the nociception, so provoke, provoking the trigeminal cervical system, it will, uh, you know, through second order neurons pass information through the thalamus and to the cortex. Then you got a pain response. And the pain response is not just located where you were impressing because of the trigeminal cervical complex itself that we say is a convergence region of afferent information from the trigeminal to the and the cervical region. So it's a kind of a mismatch from our brain, which something which originates, some nociception which originates from a pressure from a dysfunction in the neck, which is felt and perceived in the face, in the head, in the region which is innervated by the trigeminal nerve. So again, you see that the clinical assessment is strictly linked to the neurophysiological mechanism. For that reason, it's highly important to understand those mechanisms in order to be able also to understand for ourselves as, as clinicians, but also to explain to our patients why, if I push here, you feel head pain here. That's highly important in order to improve the compliance, to explain the patients, to make them an active part of the treatment, to understand why the neck is involved and why, if I press that part, you get a headache mm -hmm. reproduction. And I was looking at it, one of your papers as well that said that migraine patients, they usually have like a higher number of uh, trigger points, right? They have a reduced mobility on the upper yeah. uh, cervical, uh, more pain sensitivity to palpation on the upper cervical. Um, even like you said, decreased mobility on thoracic, right? So you have a lot of like different factors that you find yeah. that related the um, um, less activation of the stabilizing muscles as well. So do you want to mention a little bit about those factors? Like, do you think there is anything here that's important to, to mention? Yeah, we must consider that there are some kind of dysfunction which are directly linked to the headache, like the one that I was talking before, which as I said, that's the most important. But then, as you were saying, there are a lot of other dysfunctions which are highly prevalent, which doesn't show a direct link. 
I mean, if you have a limited range of motion, if you are unable of recruiting the deep uh, um, neck flexors muscles, that's not directly linked to the to the headache features. But we know that in some kind of way there is an association. Different papers, not only from my research group but also from before, has shown that, for example, if you have a forwarded posture, it means that you have a worse clinical picture of your tension type headache. If you have a restricted range of motion or less activation of the stabilizing muscles, again, that provokes is linked to a worse clinical picture, meaning more frequency, more duration, more intensity of your headache attacks. So a lot of musculoskeletal dysfunction, even those who are not directly linked to the reproduction of headache, uh, are highly important. And for example, about, as you were mentioning, muscle recruitment, we know that something which is really interesting in migraine patient is that there is a less uh, specific action of recruitment, meaning that migraine patients, if you ask them to bend, to side bend the neck and the head, the left or right, or tilt the head, rotate to the left or right, or extend and flex, they're unable of isolating only the correct muscle which should perform that action, meaning that there is a co-activation of superficial, deeper, agonist and antagonist muscles all the time that they are moving their head, basically. And that helps also in my, uh, in my mind, in my idea, to understand why they develop so much myofascial trigger point, so much muscle dysfunction, so much stiffness. They complain about, you know, fatigue in the neck because they are always using the neck in the wrong way all the time that they are moving or even just sustaining a posture while working at a computer. The neck muscles are not working properly. With EMG analysis, EMG surface analysis, they discover this kind of imbalance in the activation, this strong activation of muscle which not, should not be working, which becomes basically overloaded. If they are overloaded, they are fatigued, they are, have less you know, energy to be active when, they, when it's needed, and they can become a source of nociception again. Yeah. And so now treatment-wise, do you have any, like, uh, techniques that you recommend that you feel like are more effective because mobility we know how to like improve the joint mobility like any manual therapy like on your research or anything that you suggest is more efficient or is just like general manual therapy general mobility exercises mobilization yeah I think that the approach should be quite specific Otherwise, what I see in the clinic is that most of my patients come to me saying, oh, I have already been treated in my neck by an osteopath or another physical therapist. And they say, okay, how was your headache after the treatment? They say, nothing has changed. And then we start uh, you know, our, uh, our treatment, our management together, and they improve a lot. And they say, so what's the question? What's the difference? And I always try to explain them that it must be addressed in a specific way. So just, you know, treating the neck, as you would say, and you would do in a, in a neck patient is not enough. So we must be able, again, to find the right dysfunction, the specific dysfunction, and to treat them. And most of all, we must be able to, re to reduce the source of nociception. So I would say, like the assessment, that the most important is being able to find uh, areas which reproduce the pain and switching off this kind of, uh, uh, you know, of triggers which doesn't mean just the myofascial trigger point, but also joint dysfunctions. So the idea is to find a way uh, in which with different techniques, which could be mobilization, spinal manipulation as well, could be soft tissue techniques, could be exercise. And for exercise, I mean general exercise as well as specific exercise targeting the, the muscle dysfunction that we found or, or the joint restriction that we found. We must be able in all this kind of way to improve the neck functionality to reduce the amount of uh, uh, nociceptive information coming from the neck to the trigeminal cervical uh, complex. I would not say that there is one single protocol. Uh, also, when I teach my courses, uh, I know that it would be easier for students, for colleagues to say, okay, if you have a migraine patient, let's do a spinal manipulation of C1, C2, then you treat the myofascial trigger point of the sternocleidomastoid, then you give a home exercise about the deep neck flexors. It would be easier, but would be not working at all. As, uh, as I told you, the most important thing is that every single techniques that we decide to apply about manual therapy intervention must be something which is totally linked to the assessment that we've done before. Uh, sometimes in some courses, you see that you assess the patient in one way, and then regardless of the dysfunction that you find, the, 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 the approach, the manual therapy approach is a kind of protocol standardized. 
So I always ask myself, so why do you have to perform the assessment if whatever the assessment says you treat the patients in the same way? Uh, so in our view, that is totally different. So I, I never treat two different uh, consecutive migraine patients that I could have in one morning, for example, in my clinic, exactly in the same way. We could say that there is a 50 to 70% of the techniques which are shared and common to different patients. But then there is at least a 30-50%, which is totally different because maybe a patient requires spinal manipulation of C1, C2, another one doesn't require some manipulation at all. Uh, one requires a mobilization of the thoracic spine, and another one doesn't require that and maybe requires a trigger point treatment. So uh, I would not say that there is a standard approach. I would say that the clinical reasoning is the most important for understanding which are the best techniques for that specific patients according to your experience, your manual skill, to the preference of the patients, uh, to what has already been done before to the patients. So, I mean, it's really complicated because you have to enter into a clinical reasoning which relies on musculoskeletal dysfunction of the diagnosis of the patient, on your skill, on many different aspects, which uh, doesn't allow us to standardize the treatment uh, as it would as it would be more easy to do. I know I recognize that, but that's the interesting to me part of migraine uh, and primary headache management that is really complicated. And uh, let me say that the most complicated part I don't think is the manual part. I mean that uh, if you are skilled as a manual therapist, if you take a master uh, degree or some other courses, the techniques by themselves are, are nothing so complicated. The problem is, and the most difficult part, is entering into you know this kind of reasoning and just applying the techniques according to what's happening in the neurophysiological aspects of the migraine brain, because we are really trying to not just, you know, to fix a muscle, fix a joint. We are trying to fix a joint or fix a muscle in order to provoke a change in the central nervous system, which is the main problem in migraine patient and tension type. So we are trying to work in the periphery in order to have an improvement. We should be not just in the local tissue. For sure, after that, I give you a spinal manipulation or a mobilization. The movement quality and quantity can improve and the patients can feel, you know, an easier movement and whatever. But the real goal is not to have a local intervention, but a local intervention which should, in some kind of way, desensitize, you know, something highly more important, which is the central nervous system. Yeah. So I guess it, it should be you should be very good at identifying all those main factors that we are just talking about that you see, that you observe in patients that have a migraine, like the trigger points, the, all of those items that we listed. Be really good, get really good at assessing them so then you can identify the right factors in order to treat and have some results. And potentially, ideally, trying to reproduce the symptoms, right? Yeah, exactly. I would say that everything starts from the right assessment. If, if you perform the right musculoskeletal assessment, the treatment comes quite easier. Because also in, in my approach, most of the assessment techniques, they become st the treatment techniques as well. I mean, if you find a dysfunction with a test, by just keep on going with that test, it can become a mobilization or a mobilization, or when you are, if you are talking about the joint dysfunction, or if you are moving to the uh, muscle or nerve dysfunction by, treat, by um, assessing it, sensitivity, because we are just assessing muscle and nerve sensitivity, you can easily treat them by continuing with the same techniques that was the assessment techniques. And let me say that the, our intervention is just not, is not just manual therapy intervention. If we want to be complete as much as possible as physical therapist, but should always include specific exercise, general advices about uh, sleep, uh, hygiene, and uh, physical activity in general which is highly important because most migrant patients are physically in inactive because they're afraid of getting worse with physical exercise. And we must be able to explain them why exercising is safe because we are plenty of literature showing that physical uh, exercise, in particular aerobic uh, exercise is good for them and can have a, a prophylactic effect. So they are skipping and they are avoiding of moving. And with the literature is saying that if they move, they feel better. So that's something that we must be able to educate them about that. And the last thing I would say is about pain neuroscience education. So targeting directly the brain with, uh, you know, improving the coping strategies, improving the pain knowledge and the beliefs about the patient, their attitude about how they manage and the, how they view and they consider their migraine condition. 
that's something that I'm really investing a lot of time in the last few years into research and clinical activity as well, because I really believe that a huge difference can be done by, by pain neuroscience education. I mean that if I just treat you, I mean, if I'm just treating the neck dysfunction, that can help for sure. But if I put that into a context of education in which I'm really explaining you what I'm doing, why those dysfunction are important, what creates the pain and how you should react and behave and what are the right ideas and knowledge that you should have about the pain, the pain biology and the migraine mechanism, I see that re really helpful in those kind of patients because they really want to have information about their condition and mainly they never received those kind of information before from any clinicians. No, so they really want to be educated. They want to be treated for sure. They want to be educated. And also in order to increase the compliance to physical exercise, for example, to home exercise, you need to explain them and to educate why it is important. Otherwise, if they're used to lay on the sofa, they will never get out and move, which is highly important in, uh, in our viewpoint. And just to, uh, to make, to make, just to make you understand, because what one could say at this stage of our, uh, you know, uh, of our interview, uh, what about the medication? I mean, if the medication is working good, there should there should not be any patients for us, any patients complaining about musculoskeletal dysfunction and migraine together. But patients are still quite unlucky about the medication side, because we know from the literature that sixty eight percent of patients with the prophylactic drugs interrupt the medication in the first six months. That means that because of the side effects, so they don't tolerate the medication or because the lack of efficacy, they decide in the first six months to go back to the neurologist and say, I don't want to take this pill anymore. It's not helpful or I can't tolerate it. I'm, you know, having so much, so strong side effects that I, I prefer my headache instead. I, I had sometimes some patients say I had such strong side effects that, I mean, life with migraine was better than life with side effect of medication for not having migraine. So that, that, that that's terrible. That, I mean, you find something that helps you, but on the other hand, give you some so strong side effects that you are, don't want to tolerate it anymore. So because of the huge proportion of patients which are not responders to medication, our intervention is even more important. And we are not treating for sure just patients which are not, you know, good responders to medication. Most of my patients are also under medication. So our goal is the medication has helped about 20, 30, 40% of your migraine complaints. I will see if I can help you about other 20, 30, 40 or whatever. So it's put in combination. It's not against. I would never stay, stop the medication and come to me. If you're taking the medication, keep on going with the medication if you're fine. If you are not satisfied, you're not taking it anymore. Come to me anyway. I mean, I, we can work without medication. So that's something that we have to agree, find an agreement with the neurologist. I always write an e email or call the neurologist, which is, uh, you know, following our patients in order to have a, a, a shared diagnosis, a shared therapeutical plan. I am gonna inform them about my intervention and I wanna know if they're gonna change the prophylactic medication as well. So it's nice also to have this kind of interaction, which is not always so easy, as you can imagine, uh, because at, le at least in, in, in my country, in Italy, most of the neurologists are used to, that they are the only one treating migrant patients and tension type headache patients. So include somebody else, you know, it's not always easy because you don't know who, the, who is that person, if it's, you know, able to uh, have a good clinical reasoning, a good intervention of their patient or not. But it's, uh, again, really, I found it really stimulating in order to create an improvement in the general, you know, man management of headache patients, not just from our viewpoint, but also in terms of different health practitioners trying to do their best according to their skills, to their knowledge in order to help these patients, which as we said before, are highly disabled and uh, have a life which is really interrupted and disrupted by the severity and disability created by migraine and tension type. Yeah. Yeah, that would be the ideal scenario, combine forces and help each other to uh, benefit the patient. So yeah, that would be awesome if it was always like that, right? Yeah, in our uh, dream, I mean, uh, my dream is that the patient is seen by a uh, you know, a, a psychologist, a neurologist, that skills physical therapist. There are so many different clinicians which could help those kind of patients. 
I'm not saying that every migraine patient needs to go to the psychologist, to the physical therapist, neurologist, nutritional advice or whatever, but at least to receive a, you know, a first visit in which you understand if that aspect is important. So if nutritional aspects are not important, you can skip. If, uh, for example, psychological aspects are not important, you can skip. As well as it can happen to me that if I don't find any musculoskeletal aspect which is relevant, I would just conclude, okay, nice to meet you. I don't think I'm the right person for helping you, but maybe I can just give you some advice, some exercise, but then we stop because I don't think that having a program of uh, manual therapy intervention could be helpful. But to be honest, I have to say that I really few the patients that I see that has zero musculoskeletal uh, impairments that n- doesn't need to be treated. As we said before, if you remember, uh, up to 90, 93% had at least three dysfunction. So 93 in my clinical practice, I would say even more. Uh, I find maybe two or three patients every year with doesn't require musculoskeletal treatment and they come to me and they are quite uh, unsatisfied when I say that I can't treat them but I always explain that I am going to treat them just if I found some dysfunction. Otherwise, they're going to waste time. They're going to waste money. Uh, they already wasted a lot of time and money before, probably. So I don't want to be the next one failing with them, promising something which can, you, can, you can't obtain. Because if you don't have anything that I can work on, I, I mean, I, I can't help you to improve. Yeah, absolutely. And Matteo, before we transition to the final questions, anything that you want to add to everything that we discussed so far? Yeah, I would say just as a general uh, consideration to all colleagues which are uh, interested uh, in approaching uh, addict patients to be really open-minded. I mean, with open-minded, I mean that they really have to be uh, open to uh, all the different aspects which may be involved, open to understand the complexity of primary addict patients which uh, I've been treating for sure a lot of uh, uh, shoulder patients, low back pain patients before, and so most of the patients that we see as physical therapists in the clinic. And I would say that the most fascinating part about headache management is that it's much more complicated, at least in my opinion. It requires you to have an, you know, a mind and the clinical reasoning, which is even more complicated as the one that you're usually doing in order to understand how from the periphery, whatever we are doing as an, as an influence on something which is a way more complex, like the brain itself, like the hyper excitability of the brain. And if you understand that we are not treating dysfunction as dysfunction, but we're treating dysfunction as source of nociception, which can contribute to something, you know, even worse into the brain, I think that we can make the difference. So I would suggest to approach to the, those kind of patients, this kind of pathology and clinical conditions, uh, really not just thinking about, I must be able to identify these functions, which as physical therapists, manual therapists, we are all very well skilled, I think, but in terms of getting used to reason and to understand what we are really doing when we are treating the periphery in those kind of patients. Yeah, and they can go check our papers that you describe all those items that we were mentioning before uh, as like the, the common dysfunctions that you identify on migraine patients. I thought that was very helpful. So let's transition to the final questions. Any resource of information that you like in particular or that you recommend our listeners? Yeah, I would say that uh, if you're interested uh, in uh, going into details about all the different topics that we addressed today, I would suggest uh, some uh, uh, research papers. I mean, not books, because unfortunately, uh, I'm, I, I'm not aware. I mean, there is one book, really one, and I think it's the only one, written by Cesar Fernandez de la Peña and colleagues, which is a friend of mine. He's a physical therapist from Madrid in Spain. Uh, he has published plenty of research about tension type headache and migraine. And the, in the last few years, he wrote a book about the management uh, of... Uh, but it was mostly on cervicogenic headache for that reason. Uh, but mostly I would say that if you're interested into the pathophysiology of migraine, I would suggest to read the, 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 the papers from uh, um, Godsby and Ashina, which are two medical doctors, which are the two main researchers in the field of pathophysiology. While if we are interested more in clinical aspects as physical therapists, I would suggest Cesar Fernandez de la Peña's papers from Madrid, 
and uh, Kerstin Lutschke, which is a physical therapist from Hamburg, from, from Germany. And she again published a lot. Also, the first papers about uh, musculoskeletal dysfunction has been published by her and her group. Uh, Dean Watson, which is a colleague, another physical therapist from Australia, which published a, a lot about reproduction and resolution. Uh, so you see that there are different physical therapists in different parts of the world which are trying to study the role of uh, neck dysfunctions and different aspects related to primary headache. And for sure, the paper that I published with my group, you can find a lot of them as well. And uh, I can provide them if you need, uh, I can, if it can be of any help. But I would say that, uh, yeah, going into PubMed and search for those authors is the best way to, to, to really introduce you and to see into details all the different aspects that we have been uh, addressing today in our conversation. Awesome. And any advice to clinicians that are starting their careers? Uh, yeah, especially if you are starting your careers into uh, headache management. Uh, I don't want to be repetitive, but I would say mostly the same thing that I said before. So I would say to uh, uh, clinicians which are starting their career in general, not just on headaches, just to be more you know general, um, not to make the error, at least that uh, I, I, I've done at the beginning of my experience, to want to know always more and more up and uh, you know learn so, so many techniques, so many treatments, so many different skills as they come with experience, but try to focus more also on the clinical reasoning. Because as physical therapists, you know, the, the, this manual skill, they comes with practicing and practicing and practicing. So it requires times. And instead of getting too many courses in which they teach you just new techniques about treatment that then you don't have time uh, or you don't know when to apply them, I would probably suggest also to think more about, okay, why am I doing this, this technique? when it's going to be helpful, on which kind of patient, in which kind of specific situation, how can I combine it with other techniques, how can it be integrated with other approach that I really use. So try always to think in a more general way and not about improving your manual skill, like most of the manual therapists are really obsessed just to, you know, learn a new spinal manipulation technique for C1, C2, and new techniques for treating a myofascial trigger point. But that comes with experience. The most hard, the hardest part, I would say, is always about exactly know what you are really doing with your hand and how to include that in a multimodal and multi-global management and clinical reasoning. That would be the best op the best advice I would, I would say, not to do like I have done in my first experience, in which I took so many courses in the first two years after graduated, and then I realized that I was, you know, I didn't have time to practice all these things, and I didn't know really what I was doing. I was just trying to reproduce the things that I've seen in the courses, in the live courses. And then I asked myself, but why am I doing these techniques? Just because a guy coming from the other part of the world told me to use that. But I don't know why I'm using that on the specific patients. So, I mean, I, it's a, it was not all, all about that. But I think it's a, an important part that uh, also when I teach to my students uh, at university in the last year before they graduate, I always try to explain because they always ask suggestions, like, okay, well, what is the first course that I have to do when I finish university? And I always say, do the course that whatever you want, but don't do too many courses altogether in the first period, just because you feel that you need to know more and to learn more skill in your manual therapy, because they comes with experience. It's, you know, it requires time. It's not something so easily and so fast to get uh, all the skill that you need and all the clinical reasoning that you must be able to perform on your patients. Especially coming back to headache, if there are headache patients which are really comply, comply, as you have seen before, they're really complicated and the management is complicated. The pathology itself is complicated and the clinical reasoning and the multimodal management as well. But if you take your time in order to consider all these aspects, I think that you can make a huge difference for those patients as well. Yeah. And I think it goes back to clinical rationale and really being really good at assessing patients. So I think that's such a yeah. Just that's saying. the most important because the uh, the goal I would say uh, just trying to link with what we are doing now with my research group is to cluster patients. As we, we said at the beginning, migraine or tension type are just two boxes in which the neurologist put different headaches form. From our viewpoint as physical therapists. When I know that you are at the diagnosis of migraine or tension type headache, it doesn't say anything about which dysfunction do you have. 
So we are trying to create different cluster uh, according to the musculoskeletal dysfunction, to the sensitization level, and to the psychological complaints. So if we can create different cluster, probably we will be able to identify in a more clinical and scientific way uh, patients with different therapeutical needs. So I know that you must be targeted just in the periphery or also with central mechanism or also on psychological complaints because the, the goal as physical therapists, I think, in the next few years would be to being uh, be to improve the ability of profiling and finding the right patients for us in order not to treat all patients with migraine and uh, not being able to help some of them just because you are not doing the, perf the correct profiling and the, perf uh, and the correct profile. Um, musculoskeletal assessment at the beginning. So the assessment definitely is the most important in the beginning. Yeah. And Matteo, last question. Yeah. What personal uh, qualities and abilities that you think are important to be a successful PT? Well, in general. In ge I think it's just probably one of the things that you just said. <laughs> no, I could add something different. In general, as a physical therapist, uh, uh, okay. it... Uh, it, come, it comes back to something that probably I said at the beginning of our conversation, and but we can expand a bit more. I would say that, again, uh, more than the manual skill that comes with experience and that we are obsessed by them most of the time, I would, uh, yeah, I said that before about uh, the, um, when I was presenting myself saying that I study cognitive neuroscience, which is uh, in the faculty of psychology. I take a master of science in that because I felt that the knowledge I had about uh, uh, communication, explanation, uh, understanding the cognitive aspect of pain and patients' perception pain, and when you have a pain, uh, patients uh, with uh, chronic pain, in particular in your clinic, were not enough, in my opinion. So I would say that uh, I would suggest uh, as the best uh, option for sure the manual skill, and we don't have to think about that because we all know how important is the manual skill, which and the experience. But I would say the empathy. Uh, the ability of listening and to communicate, the validation of the experience, of the pain experience reported by our patients, the explanation like the one provided with the pain neuroscience education, our skill that usually as physical therapists we are not so really used to, to train, or at least we consider them as something secondary, but I would put them at least after 15 years working with chronic pain patients on the same level of manual skill. Otherwise, just the manual skill without all these other aspects may help in a lot of patients. But in the most complex patients, especially those who are chronic, those who have a lot of comorbidity, who already have a lot of failure in their uh, previous attempt of therapeutic uh, improvement, I would say that probably you will, otherwise you're going to be just the next one who is failing in helping them. Even if you are the best in town in terms of manual therapy skill, but if you like about all the other, uh, we could say psychological aspect, I think that uh, here you can make the difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's about, a lot about education, talking, explaining, and not as much as the techniques, especially in those chronic patients, as you mentioned. Yeah, I, I would say that it's strength and the effect of the techniques. If you are doing one techniques on a patient and you're explaining what's happening, for example, about the reproduction of headache, I mean, I can't do that without explaining why it is happening, why it's coming the heading and why it's disappearing. I have to teach you that I'm pressing here. There is a mechanism for sure in a comprehensive, I mean, in an easy way that the patient can understand. I mean, I'm not talking about neurophysiology like we said before, but explaining that if I press here, there are some mechanisms which are facilitated that leads to have a reproduction of pain in your head. And that if I work that region, I can decrease that and so that, that you can have an improvement and whatever, blah, 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 it comes as an explanation. That's part of the education, which strengthens the effect of what I'm doing with my hands on technique. So they are totally linked in my view. I mean, I'm not saying that they are separate. We, are not, we don't have to be psychologists. There are really a lot of psychologists working in, on those complaints. We have the power of being the only clinician who are touching, treating the patients and talking and educating the patient. We are doing both together. And also in terms of exercise, for example, providing the best explanation. It's not enough to tell you, you have to exercise. Do this 15 times, I mean, 15 repetitions or whatever they are. I must explain you why it is important. Why it's going to be helpful for your headache, for example. Why it is important that you 
change your lifestyle and use sleep in a better way. So education, communication, and uh, changing the behavior of the patient, I think, is highly important also in order to improve the, 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 the result of what you're doing with your hands. Yeah, absolutely. Matteo, um, if people want to learn more about you or find you, contact you, how they can, they can be in touch with you? Yeah, they can contact me on Twitter if they want. Uh, so I, I, maybe I can give you later and you can uh, share with them, with the people which are uh, listening to the postcard, my, my, the contact, uh, my contacts in order to get contacted for any question about uh, papers, courses, or just general information about I'm having those kind of trouble of managing these patients with headache. Uh, like I say in my live courses, I always say, uh, write me whatever you want. I will always answer, but give me the time. <laughs> I, in some <laughs> special period of my life, it really requires some time. So I will not be so immediate in the response, but I will answer always. And I will be glad to help you if I can or provide you the information that you need. Definitely. Awesome. Matteo, thank you so much for taking the time and share your knowledge, share your research and everything that you've been studying and finding out and helping us improve our approach on treating those very complex patients. Yeah, I hope that I, I told our colleagues something new, at least something interesting. I hope that it was not too boring, especially in the first part, which I, because I, re, I realized that it's a bit complicated. But uh, now we understand that if you want to talk and manage about those patients, it's important to understand those mechanisms as well. And so I'm really glad to have this conversation, this interview today with you. So thanks again, Mariana, for inviting me to, to, to record this interview. Yeah, it was a great overview. So I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.